What comes to mind when hearing the name Nikola Tesla? A name many are familiar with and associate various technologies, inventions, and advanced theories. All of this appears to eclipse a catalytic event in the story of Tesla, and strangely he is seldomly mentioned in official documents. That event being the Columbian Exposition of 1893. So thank you for joining me, and this is episode 9 in the series, Tesla and the Electric City. Let's begin. This event provides a unique opportunity to branch off into various directions, delving into different topics and people that have direct correlations with the exposition, potentially expanding into larger explorations and series themselves. As usual, using documents of the time to provide a better understanding of how these historical pieces are intertwined. We begin our story with a book by Thomas C. Martin, published in 1894 called The Inventions, Researches, and Writings of Nikola Tesla. As an introduction, a few words of biographical nature will, it is deemed, not be out of place, nor other than welcome. Nikola Tesla was born in 1857 at Smilyan Laika, a borderland region of Austria-Hungary, of the Serbian race which has maintained against Turkey and all comers so unceasing a struggle for freedom, his family is an old and representative one among these Switzers of Eastern Europe, and his father was an eloquent clergyman in the Greek church. An uncle is today metropolitan in Bosnia. His mother was a woman of inherited ingenuity and delighted not only in skillful work of the ordinary household character, but in the construction of such mechanical appliances as looms and churns, and other machinery required in a rural community. Nicola was educated at Gospich in the public school for four years, and then spent three years in the real school. He was then sent to Karstadt, Croatia, where he continued his studies for three years in the higher real school. There, for the first time, he saw a steam locomotive, he graduated in 1873 and surviving an attack of cholera devoted himself to experimentation, especially in electricity and magnetism. His father would have had him maintain the family tradition of entering the church, but native genius was too strong and he was allowed to enter the polytechnic school at Graz to finish his studies and with the object of becoming a professor of mathematics and physics. One of the machines there experimented with was a Graham dynamo, used as a motor. Despite his instructor's perfect demonstration of the fact that it was impossible to operate a dynamo without a computator or brushes, Mr. Tesla could not be convinced that such accessories were necessary or desirable. He had already seen with quick intuition that a way could be found to dispense with them. And from that time, he may be said to have begun work on the ideas that fructified ultimately in his rotating field motors. In the second year of his Gratz course, Mr. Tesla gave up the notion of becoming a teacher and took up the engineering curriculum. His studies ended, he returned home in time to see his father die, and then went to Prague and Budapest to study languages with the object of qualifying himself broadly for the practice of the engineering profession. For a short time, he served as an assistant in the government telegraph engineering department, and then became associated with M. Puskas, a personal and family friend, and other exploiters of the telephone in Hungary. He made a number of telephonic inventions, but found his opportunities of benefiting by them limited in various ways. To gain a wider field of action, he pushed on to Paris and there secured employment as an electrical engineer with one of the large companies in the new industry of electric lighting. It was during this time period, and as early as 1882, that he began serious and continued efforts to embody the rotating field principle in operative apparatus. He was enthusiastic about it, believed it to mark a new departure in the electrical arts, and could think of nothing else. 
In fact, but for the solicitations of a few friends in commercial circles who urged him to form a company to exploit the invention, Mr. Tesla, then a youth of little worldly experience, would have sought an immediate opportunity to publish his ideas, believing them to be worthy of note as a novel and radical advance in electrical theory as well as destined to have a profound influence on all dynamo electric machinery. At last he determined that it would be best to try his fortunes in America. In France he had met many Americans, and in contact with them learned the desirability of turning every new idea in electricity to practical use. He learned also of the ready encouragement given in the United States to any inventor who could attain some new and valuable result. The resolution was formed with characteristic quickness, and abandoning all his prospects in Europe, he at once set his face westward. Arrived in the United States, Mr. Tesla took off his coat the day he arrived in the Edison Works. That place had been a goal of his ambition and one can readily imagine the benefit and stimulus derived from association with Mr. Edison, for whom Mr. Tesla has always had the strongest admiration. It was impossible, however, that with his own ideas to carry out and his own inventions to develop, Mr. Tesla could long remain in even the most delightful employ, and his work now attracting attention, he left the Edison ranks to join a company intended to make and sell an arc lighting system based on some of his inventions in that branch of the art. With unceasing diligence he brought the system to perfection and saw it placed on the market, but the thing which most occupied his time and thoughts, however all through this period, was his old discovery of the rotating field principle for alternating current work, and the application of it in motors that have now become known the world over. Strong as his convictions on the subject then were, it is a fact that he stood very much alone, for the alternating current had no well recognized place, few electrical engineers had ever used it, and the majority were entirely unfamiliar with its value or even its essential features. Even Mr. Tesla himself did not, until after protracted effort and experimentation, learn how to construct alternating current apparatus of fair efficiency, but that he had accomplished his purpose was shown by the tests of Professor Anthony, made in the winter of 1887 and 88. When Tesla Motors in the hands of that distinguished expert gave an efficiency equal to that of direct current motors, nothing now stood in the way of the commercial development and introduction of such motors except that they had to be constructed with a view to operating on the circuits then existing, which in this country were all of high frequency. The first full publication of his work in this direction outside his patents was a paper read before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in New York in May 1888, read at the suggestion of Professor Anthony and the present writer. When he exhibited motors that had been in operation long previous, and with which his belief that brushes and computators could be dispensed with was triumphantly proved to be correct. Having noted for years the many advantages obtainable with alternating currents, Mr. Tesla was naturally led on to experiment with them at higher potentials and higher frequencies than were common or approved of, ever pressing forward to determine in even the slightest degree the outlines of the unknown. He was rewarded very quickly in this field with results of the most surprising nature. Mr. Tesla's work ranges far beyond the vast departments of polyphase currents and high potential lighting. The miscellaneous section of this volume includes a great many other inventions in arc lighting, transformers, pyromagnetic generators, thermomagnetic motors, third brush regulation, improvements in dynamos, new forms of incandescent lamps, electrical meters, condensers, unipolar dynamos, the conversation of alternating into direct currents, etc. It is needless to say that at this moment Mr. Tesla is engaged on a number of interesting ideas and inventions to be made public in due course. With that introduction to Mr. Tesla, 
we shift our direction into other published materials that describe his aspirations, accomplishments, and general reception of his ideas in electrical sciences. Let's begin with new electrical research in March of 1891, showcased in Scientific American. We published this week one of the most valuable contributions to our knowledge of the properties and possibilities of alternating currents that has appeared for several years. The experiments of Nikola Tesla on alternating currents of almost transcendental frequency give a deep insight into one of the most extraordinary portions of electrical science. Mr. Tesla has worked with dynamos, giving as high as 25,000 alternations per second and consequently has within his grasp a class of phenomenon that are only hinted at so as long as experiments are confined to the frequencies in ordinary use. Not only is the work suggestive of practical results in the way of transforming by condensers, which with such frequencies becomes comparatively easy on account of the very small capacity required, but it is rich in suggestiveness as regards the relations between so-called electrical currents and the action that goes on in the dielectric. With a dynamo giving 20 to 25,000 alternations per second, at an electromotive force of 500 volts, static effects become enormously enhanced. An immense amount of energy is distributed through the medium surrounding the machine, and in fact, the experimenter may almost be said to be working in the dielectric of a condenser, of which the machine forms one surface and the surrounding walls the other. When incandescent lamps, short-circuited by a bit of copper, rod glow with intense brilliance at some distance from the induction coil connected to the machine, Geisler tubes, unprovided with any terminals whatsoever, spring into brilliant radiance, and even an incandescent lamp grows hot when brought near to the coil. The experimenter suddenly awakes from his dream of electrical energy as a thing carried along a wire into the almost appalling consciousness that the energy in the dielectric is really the only thing with which he has to do. We cannot, in the brief space available in these columns, give any adequate idea of the interest and beauty of the results that Mr. Tesla obtained in this novel line of work. The paper itself must be read and carefully reread to appreciate the importance of the work. But even the striking experiments of a slight importance as compared with the theoretical results that are suggested by them. When displacement currents heretofore sought with almost negative results rise to a magnitude that heats the solid dielectric of the condenser almost to melting, one realizes with startling distinctiveness the truth of Maxwell's prophetic suggestions. Whatever be our ultimate conception, as to the nature of electricity, we are forced to the conclusion that the energy distributed through the dielectric is the all-important thing in electrical phenomena, and that the surface conditions that we know as electrification and current are comparatively subsidiary. Electrostatic induction and electromagnetic radiation seem simple, almost necessary facts when we can work in a medium surcharged by the tremendous electrical stresses that make themselves evident in such a machine as that with which Mr. Tesla experimented. Even if this research should lead to no results of immediate commercial importance, it at least marks an epoch in scientific investigation by casting a flood of light upon the phenomenon that till now have existed merely as residual effects sought in vain by the experimenter, or noticed only as the concomitants of other and apparently more important electrical actions. It is interesting reading sections such as this that portray the various avenues Tesla was working through and providing workable solutions, or at the very least marks an epoch of scientific investigation. It seems alternating current and Tesla are intimately intertwined. In the same publication, Scientific American, on March 26th of 1892, we gain a glimpse to one of Tesla's lectures, which was given in London and Paris, showcasing experiments on alternating currents of great frequency. 
Mr. Nikola Tesla, to whom the English and French scientific public has just accorded a very warm reception, is a pioneer in electrical science and one of those who will have influenced future progress through an almost radical transformation of the old processes and old methods. Someday we shall have occasion to describe the two alternating current motors devised by Mr. Tesla as long ago as 1888. At present, we shall content ourselves with recurring to his magnificent experiments on high potentials and alternating currents of great frequency, of which we have already given a complete idea in summarizing the communication made by the author on the 20th of May, 1891, before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. In the train of this communication, which made a very great sensation in the scientific world, Mr. Tesla, acceding to the present solicitations of his friends and admirers, came to Europe and performed at London on February 3rd and at Paris on the 19th of the same month before the French Society of Physics and the International Society of Electricians assembled in the Hall of the Society of Encouragement. The remarkable experiments of which we were witness and of which we propose to give an idea, despite the dryness of the subject, its very special character, and our inability to make a clear exposition of it. Mr. Tesla did not content himself with a simple repetition of the experiments made in America, but he extended them and rendered them complete, and the communications made in Europe may be considered as the second part of a long and remarkable study of which the first part was presented in the New World last year. In the first place, let us briefly recall the processes employed by Mr. Tesla for the production of alternating currents of great frequency. The simplest consists in the use of an alternator of special form, which is represented herewith in figure two. This consists of a steel disc 30 inches in diameter upon which are mounted 384 small bobbins or more accurately 384 small zigzag windings. This disc revolves in the interior of a fixed ring, carrying 384 inductor poles. The result is that the frequency of the alternating currents engendered by the revolution of the armature before the inductors produces 192 periods per revolution, and that at the normal maximum velocity of 3,000 revolutions per minute, or 30 per second, a frequency of 9,600 periods per second is obtained, instead of the 100 solely that ordinary alternators give. The alternating current thus engendered is collected through the aid of two rings, against which two brushes rub, as in all alternators with movable armature. A separate excitation permits of varying, at will the alternator's electric motive force, which under full excitation may reach 200 volts. In the second process employed by Mr. Tesla for obtaining much greater frequencies, which may reach and even exceed a million per second, he utilizes an ordinary alternator. In the experiments of February 19th, he employed a Seisman's alternator whose frequency did not exceed 50 periods per second. The alternating current thus produced is sent to an induction coil by establishing in derivation upon the primary circuit, a disruptive discharge apparatus formed of a condenser and two polished balls whose distance apart may be varied. This spacing regulates the frequency of the discharges and consequently the frequency of the currents traversing the inductor of the bobbin. The sparks of the disruptive discharges burst forth in a powerful magnetic field which facilitates their rapid production, as well as the cooling of the space wherein they are produced with so great a rapidity. Whatever be the process employed for obtaining great frequencies, the potential is always inadequate, and it is increased by transforming the alternating current by the aid of a suitable bobbin. This latter consists of an internal inductor winding and an external armature winding formed of relatively coarse wire and of a number of quite small spirals, for it must not be lost sight of that 
seeing the great frequency of the current, the electromotive force developed for a given length of wire is incomparably higher than with ordinary bobbins. These bobbins have no iron core and are completely submerged in boiled linseed oil, the object of which is to secure perfect insulation and to prevent the presence of air, which in this particular case would be very prejudicial through the considerable heating that it would produce under the action of the enormous frequently reversed electrostatic tensions to which it would be submitted. In order to obtain powerful effects, Mr. Tesla overcomes the prejudicial effects of self-induction by utilizing the properties of condensers properly interposed in the circuit of the alternator or in derivation upon the terminals of the disruptive discharge apparatus. A certain number of the experiments made by Mr. Tesla on February 19th were merely a reproduction of those that were spoken of before. We shall therefore not reproduce them, but shall dwell more especially upon those that present a character of novelty. The first experiments were made with the disruptive discharge apparatus, that which gives the greatest frequencies at present obtainable by the means at our disposal. In these conditions, the electrostatic discharges traverse the air under the form of luminous discharges, as if the air were rarefied. On interposing an ebonite plate, the electrostatic capacity of the system formed by the two balls between which the discharge takes place, and the ebonite plate is increased by the interposition of a dielectric, whose specific inductive capacity is greater than that of the air, and the brightness of the discharges is thereby intensified. These discharges easily traverse long tubes containing rarefied gases, which they illuminate with a bright light, each rarefied gas giving to light its own distinctive color. The discharges occur likewise between the cotton-covered wires insulated from each other and put into connection with the two terminals of the bobbin. These wires emit a violet light throughout their entire length and even render luminous the space comprised between them. All the other experiments were made with the alternator shown in figure 2, which gives from 9,000 to 10,000 periods per second. Mr. Tesla first showed the discharges in the form of a flame. In order to prove that these discharges of high potential and great frequency are not dangerous, he was able on taking in his hands two metallic balls designed to prevent his being burned by the spark to receive the entire discharge from the bobbin, the discharge passing through his body interposed between the two balls. Mr. Tesla afterwards showed that the return wire is absolutely useless for making the discharge current pass. The latter may be established by the air and pass more easily if care be taken to connect one of the extremities of the wire to the bobbin with a conducting plate insulated in space. The molecular bombardment heats the part which presents but little surface put in communication with the second pole of the bobbin, and it was thus that Mr. Tesla showed us the incandescence of a thin platinum wire or of a carbon filament enclosed in a globe of rarefied air. Every increase in the capacity of the system increases the discharge current, and consequently, the incandescence. It suffices, for example, to bring the hand near the globe containing the incandescent body, and to place a metallic shade above the latter, or even an effect paradoxical in appearance, to place the shade alongside the globe, to produce an increase of brightness resulting from the increase of the electrostatic capacity. The wire to which the filament is attached is connected, as we have said, with the secondary wire of the bobbin, whose other wire communicates with an insulated metallic plate. Such metallic communication is not indispensable. In fact, if the wire is covered with lead, a layer of gutta percha entirely insulating the copper wire and the leaden tube that envelops it, the lamp with a single filament becomes lighted as brilliantly when it is put in communication with the copper wire or the leaden tube. Mr. Tesla thus actuated a Crookes electric radiator, 
and even a special single wire motor to describe which would lead us too far. He afterward illuminated certain bodies that are but mediocre conductors, such as alumina, carbon, lime, carborundum, and a few phosphorescent bodies such as sulfide of calcium, yttria, sulfide of zinc, and the ruby, the marvelous effects of which several times gained the unanimous applause of the spectators. Mr. Tesla finally terminated with a few experiments in the illumination of tubes of rarefied gases, without wires or electrodes. The tubes being simply placed in the periodical electrostatic field produced between one of the insulated poles of the bobbin on the one hand and an insulated metallic plate placed above the experimenter and communicating with the other pole of the bottom on the other hand. Figure 1 shows one of these experiments in which Mr. Tesla is producing the illumination of two tubes at once. In order to effect the extinction of one of these tubes, it suffices to interpose a middlingly conductive screen in the electrostatic field or to place the tube in a direction sensibly perpendicular to the flux of induction of the field. The same tube remains dark in all positions if it is held by its two extremities at once, the body forming a screen. On sliding the hand along the tube it is possible to render one of the extremities luminous. Nothing is more curious than to see the light produced by this process thus extinguished and relighted at will. Such are, very briefly described, the principal experiments which, for more than two hours, deeply interested the members of the two societies mentioned above, who had the good fortune to be present at Mr. Tesla's lecture. It would be difficult as yet to say what future is in store for them from the standpoint of an industrial utilitarian and practical new mode of production of light, the more so as the dream of the inventor is broader and his views more exalted than the experiments that he presented to us allow to be seen. His final ambition appears to be to transform the energy of the medium that environs us, and which is very evident by its numerous manifestations, into light or at least to obtain therefrom radiations of the same wavelength and same frequency as those produced luminous sensations. Crookes radiometer has already proved that it is possible to convert the radiant energy of a medium directly into mechanical energy, and although from the standpoint of rendering, this radiometer is the most detestable of all transformation apparatus, it is nonetheless the most admirable by the fact that it affords us a tangible demonstration of the possibility of such transformation. On the other hand, Mr. Tesla, in his memorable experiments, has shown us that, on periodically varying, with very great frequency, an electrostatic field, it is possible to place apparatus of great simplicity therein, such as tubes of rarefied gases, which collect to a portion of such energy and render it luminous. To the philosopher and savant nothing more is necessary to establish the possibility, if not the probability, of the realization of Mr. Tesla's final views. To him, the light of the future resides in the incandescence of solids, gases, and phosphorescent bodies, excited, if we may use somewhat vague expression, by high potentials varying with very great frequency. The young scientist is convinced of this as a precursor and almost as a prophet. He introduces so much warmth and sincerity into his explanations and experiments that faith wins us, and despite ourselves, we believe that we are witness of the dawn of a nearby revolution in the present processes of illumination. A curious dive into the details of various experiments and inner workings of alternating current Mr. Tesla's final ambition appears to be to transform the energy of the medium that environs us, and which is very evident by its numerous manifestations. This section taken from the latter part of the article reinforces this idea of electrical potential. We have indications of Tesla's wireless transfer of energy, power, or electricity. 
While these experiments were indeed impressive and showed great promise for illuminating future generations, it is important to recognize other distinguished electricians, as they were known in the Scientific American of March 26, 1892. The portraits here presented represent men who, while they have achieved notable in the electric world, have in so doing shown that they possess the requisites for success in any branch of work. Untiring industry, great ingenuity, and a belief in themselves would have made them great in any of the executive departments of life. Thomas Alva Edison's story has been told so often that it cannot be a trite one. He was born on the 11th of February, 1847, at Milan, Ohio. He began life at the age of 12 as a train boy, soon advancing to a news dealer with four young assistants. He then began practicing telegraphy and at last obtained a position in Port Huron. He soon began to invent and in 1864 he moved to Memphis and had one of his inventions, an automatic repeater, put into service. He struggled along inventing, working at his profession and experimenting until he went to Boston in 1868 where he was able to open a workshop for developing his inventions. Shortly afterward, he was retained by the Western Union Telegraph Company and started an electrical laboratory at Newark, where he employed 300 men. In 1876, he moved to Menlo Park, New Jersey, and in 1887, left Menlo Park and erected in Orange, New Jersey. What is supposed to be the largest experimental laboratory of its kind in the world. His inventions, which are numbered by hundreds, center largely on electricity, although one of the most wonderful of his achievements, the phonograph, is not an electrical invention at all. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, March 3rd, 1847, being therefore almost exactly the same age as Edison. His father and grandfather were born language teachers and the young Bell's attention was directed to language by the course of studies prescribed by his father. The synthesis of artificial speech by Hemholtz method is said to have early engaged his attention, and he resolved to pursue one of those outcomes of his studies, multiple telegraphy, to a practical conclusion. It has been said that all this time the idea of speech transmission was an undercurrent of thought with him and he has testified that before 1870, he avowed his belief that he would one day speak by telegraph. Going through all sorts of experiments, he succeeded in inventing the telephone. He lectured on it before the Society of Arts in Boston, May 25th, 1876, exhibited it at the Centennial in Philadelphia, and in August of the same year, speech, it was said, was transmitted over a telegraph line. He has received numerous honors and has written numbers of papers on his other scientific works, such as the photophone. He has also, for years, studied the subject of speech for the deaf and dumb. Elihu Thompson was born in Manchester, England, 1853, and at the age of five came to this country with his parents, who settled in Philadelphia, where he was educated graduating from the Central High School in 1870. He experimented a great deal during his boyhood in electricity and chemistry, photography and similar subjects. Graduating at the age of 17, he spent six months as an analytical chemist in a laboratory and was then appointed assisted professor of chemistry and physics in the high school and was promoted to the chair of professor of chemistry and mechanics in 1876. He frequently lectured and continually experimented during this time period, in the Artisans' Night Schools, Franklin Institute, and elsewhere. He was associated with Professor Edwin J. Houston in some patents relating to dynamos, and upon these and other inventions based the American Electric Company, since called the Thomas Houston Electric Company, organized in 1880, and became chief electrician of the company. His invention of electric welding and brazing has been fully described in the columns of the Scientific American and Supplement. His very remarkable experiments in alternating current induction have done much to win for him an international renown. 
the air blast applied to switches and computators for blowing away destructive arcs is a type of his practical way of reaching results. Like Edison, he holds a great number of patents. One quick note before moving on to Tesla's profile. This is an illustrative image of the Columbian Exposition in the article we just read through. There are various illustrations of the exposition grounds, and some differ on the architectural elements shown. Some showing this pier with buildings, and even a tall lighthouse-like structure. Some have a rounded peristyle feature near the lakeside entrance. This one caught my eye with the large tower in the background, which would be north of the Arts Palace. Now this may simply be an artistic rendition of uncompleted grounds, maybe even a representation of the exposition's answer to the Eiffel Tower from the Paris Exposition of 1889. The Ferris wheel was only in its infancy in terms of ideation and would be finalized later in the year of 1892. This illustration does not appear to include the Midway Plaisance either. An interesting note is all. Regardless, let's jump over to the Illustrated Electrical Review from March 25th of 1893 to gain a better review of Nikola Tesla in comparison to the previous electricians and inventors. I can confidently state that Nikola Tesla is one of those few productions of nature that have been termed geniuses. His individuality is assertive and his presence elevates. One cannot converse with him without feeling that a peculiar influence which he exerts. His mind is the embodiment of concentrated and continuous thinking. Thinking is his life, his pleasure, and the practical realization of his thoughts is his happiness. It is not possible to conceive of a happier mortal, for his seeking and achieving happiness are instantaneous and therefore continuous. He is always thinking, and in his flights of imagination there is nothing which is impossible, nothing which cannot at some time be realized. His passion for the new is intense, naturally of an extremely emotional disposition his nerves are constantly on a fearful tension. His willpower also is enormous. While a youth of 18 years, he used to, as source of amusement to himself, cause his heart to stop beating, solely through the powerful influence of his will. It is possible that he might have killed himself in the course of time had he not been advised by his physicians that this practice was extremely dangerous and by its continuance, he would forfeit his life. A man of thoroughly excellent habits and morals, straightforward, good-hearted, generous, honest, and unselfish, he may be properly termed an ideal gentleman, businessman of today, and especially Americans who are thoroughly in touch with the ideas of American progress, cannot put themselves in his place. He is perfectly independent, for he has no desire for pecuniary compensation. His work is above price, for it is with him the great incentive of life. He will not attempt anything that has been started by another. He is original. His line of action is entirely in the path of his thoughts, and his thoughts are so unlike what is generally imagined to be the outcome of practical man's reasoning that his work is considered marvelous. It is marvelous. But the fact that it is so considered by others is a source of real annoyance to him. He is intensely modest, and this, looking at his general character, is not surprising. The national and popular fame that he has acquired in the past few years is distasteful to him. He thinks that successful men are only original when they work on a restricted scale, and are unhampered by the many cares attending the control of a business or a large laboratory. He feels that the glamour that surrounds popular success is merely superficial. All very great inventions and discoveries are the children of those lovers of nature who have worked as minute philosophers. As soon as outward cares come, progress is hindered, and even a family, as Bacon says, is a hostage of fortune. So this man, untrammeled by domestic duties, and comparatively young, has a brilliant future before him which only unforeseen circumstances can mar. 
Sir Isaac Newton, when asked how it was that he could solve such difficult problems, answered, I simply hold the thought steadily before my mind's eye until a clear light dawns upon me. So it is with Nikola Tesla who projects and revolves the subject in his mental field of vision. He has power to concentrate his mind on the subject in hand to such an extent that it is merely a matter of time when all the mists of uncertainty clear away and the object of his thought looms up clear, comprehensive, and practical. Whenever he goes upon the lecture stage, he believes implicitly that every one of his audience must know more about the subject that he does. This is the cause of his diffidence. He dislikes anything like show, and above all that anyone should look upon him in the light of one claiming to do something supernatural. It is said that during several of his lectures, superstitious people have left the hall, believing that he was in league with the evil one. Mr. Tesla's power of concentration makes him desire solitude, and his laboratory and workshop are sealed books to the outer world. He is so constituted that unless he is insulated from the world, his trains of thought, which his assistants zealously guard, are liable to be shunted. He, therefore, only receives his friends outside of his workshop. His latchkey hangs outside of his home. His fellow workmen he makes his friends. And in all the time that he has been experimenting for himself, but one of his employees has left him, and that one returned in a very short time. His experiments are carried on at his own expense, and to the layman they would seem, as they really are, the essence of originality. As soon as some new line is commenced, his genius asserts itself, and he starts out on the new field prepared to discover. His talents are not so much in an inventive line as in the field of discovery, for he does not like to finish what another has commenced. Only that which has hitherto unknown will he attempt. His ideas are so numerous and come in such rapid succession that he never attempts to put them down. One day, for the sake of a trial, he jotted down his thoughts as they came. This he found to be so inconvenient that almost his entire time, of course outside of his moments of thought, were taken up in transcribing. His memory is wonderful, and though words may escape, ideas never leave him. In his laboratory, which is a modest retreat, he employs six workmen, all of whom are thoroughly skilled in their different lines. And he himself is a practical and thorough mechanician, many of his earlier lamps and bulbs having been made entirely by himself. He takes up but one thing at a time, and is so utterly oblivious to all that surrounds him that it seems, as he says, that there is nothing in the world for him outside of what he is thinking of, and that were a person to communicate with him on any subject foreign to his direct line of thought, they would imagine that his intellect was below the average. But as soon as he finds these apparently foreign thoughts have direct bearing on the subject at hand, then it is that they instantly become a part of his reasoning, and he is as proficient in them as if he had made that particular line the new study of his life. He comes from a very old family who are descendants of the ancient Slavs, they having settled on the borders of Austria, on the small strip of the territory called Lyca. There are a few people from the place of his birth in America. Boschewitz is a countryman of his. His father and mother were both great lovers of nature. His sisters, three in number, are all highly intellectual the youngest especially being considered quite a genius. It had often been discussed among the members of his domestic circle who was the most promising in the family. The preference was always given to this youngest sister. She is tall, strong, and remarkably heavily built. Before Nicola earned his worldwide reputation, he took second place in the family. But now his sister, whom he still modestly thinks is far superior to him in every way, has been relegated to second place. His life has been full of vicissitudes, and it was these very difficulties which made his success. When he gets an idea that 
a thing is possible, he starts out with all enthusiasm and works day and night with no rest until he gets on the path which he believes leads on to the solution. When a child, he would wait anxiously for bedtime to approach, not that it might bring sleep and rest to his youthful mind, but that he might lay abed the whole night thinking and pondering over some pet idea. Ever since he first saw the Graham machine, with its complicated computator, he believed, in fact knew, that he could make a machine which would do without this expensive accessory. He was laughed at for his pains, but no matter, history repeated itself, and he solved the problem, producing what is now known as Tesla's motor. That he is resourceful may be determined by anyone who chooses to advance to him some apparently impossible problem. Like a flash he will have some reasonable explanation, and if the subject is of enough importance to him, he will not rest until he sees that it is either possible or impossible. If it is possible, he will obtain the solution. If impossible, it will be cast off like an old garment, and he starts again on some new idea within the realm of possibility. He has theories for the solution of all difficult problems that occur in daily life, but the grand scheme ever constant in his mind and which he implicitly believes will be solved by him, the transmission of electrical power without wires, has attained such proportions that he feels sure its solution is not far distant. All his energies are bending toward it, and the possibilities that this idea conjures up will be enough to make him the most famous man and the greatest benefactor that the world could ever have. He speaks fluently the Latin languages and has remarkable conversational ability. He has a moderate income, all of which he puts into his experimenting. He has no yearning for wealth, although he feels positive that if he so choose he could be independent in a very short while. Many of his friends have urged him to go into business so as to lay aside enough money for a rainy day. To all these urgent pleas he has turned a deaf ear. Constant dropping will wear away a stone, and it may be possible that he will soon utilize his vast store of experience and manufacture some of his apparatus, which will enable those electricians who are anxious to follow in his footsteps to start in on original experimenting, and by that means carry out plans such as the perfection of details, which should not be considered by a mastermind. The descriptions that he gives of his feelings during his lectures and experimenting are intensely interesting. Generally, when he is through with his lectures, he is in an utter state of collapse. These high-frequency currents warm his body and quicken his nervous action. His recent celebrated lecture was not of such benefit to the electrical fraternity as it should have been, owing to the immense size of the hall, and that outsiders were admitted, and that the spectacular had to give place to the scientific, but in all his experiments he essays to illustrate some particular fact, new and useful, and if the electricians are fortunate enough to hear another lecture by him at the World's Fair, the mistake of admitting the non-technical public should not occur again. The photograph which accompanies this character description shows him as he is when passive, but it is impossible without talking to him to imagine the look of supreme intelligence which asserts itself in every line of his face. His deep-set eyes add to the appearance of continual intense thought, and taking his face, all in all, it unmistakably evinces the hidden genius that lies beneath its surface. There is a unique feeling reading through these articles and journals that talk about various ideas of Tesla. It is one thing to constantly hear about Tesla and his many inventions, ideas and theories, for example, wireless energy, yet to continually come across this same sentiment from sources of the time in which these technologies were being actively discussed, experiments being shown, and lectures to be heard on the revolutionary advancements in electricity is somewhat exhilarating. Learning about these various characters and their role in multiple aspects of society during this time frame. 
Next up, we're going to read through a few passages that describe Tesla's involvement with the exposition. Considering the overall magnitude of electrical scale that this event revealed, it is surprising that the names of these distinguished engineers are rarely mentioned in official exposition documents. A few highlights here and there, but nothing truly substantial. Let's explore a section from Electrical Industries, this issue describing various electrical related exhibits and progresses of the exposition. When completed, the Tesla multiphase exhibit of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company will be one of the handsomest on the grounds. The structure in the center of the space, painted cream color, touched out with gold leaf and lighted brilliantly with incandescent bulbs and short ornamental arc lamps is one of the finest yet built. Many of the features in this exhibit are entirely new and will prove of very great interest to electrical engineers. Although some of the exhibits in the various buildings are covered at night, and almost all the exhibitors leave the grounds at 6 o'clock, enough remains open for inspection to consume much time. It is a mistake that people are apt to assume that little is to be seen at night. Many of the exhibits are seen to advantage only at night, and this is especially true of many of those in the electricity building, the tower, the various illuminated signs, and the other curious features being well worth a special visit. It is reported that Nikola Tesla will show some entirely new experiments in high tension currents in a room provided for the purpose in the Westinghouse section. The Westinghouse company are preparing to exhibit various phenomena produced by currents of this nature. They will also show the working of the Wurtz non-arcing lighting arrestor for various voltages and will endeavor to produce by means of a Holtz machine all the phenomena and effects accompanying lighting on alternating currents. Let's read a bit further into this publication where it showcases the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. While the lighting system of the Westinghouse Company is best shown in the electric plant of the exposition, its exhibit in Electricity Building better represents the varied products of its factories. The exhibit is divided into sections each representing a particular branch of the industry. The section located near the center of the building between the Barbier display of lighthouse lenses and the Edison incandescent lamp exhibit contains an exhibit representing the latest system of long distance power transmission of this company. Another section occupying a similar space but toward the south of the building contains an exhibit of railway power machinery. Directly to the east of this exhibit, is the display of both arc and incandescent lighting. The Schallenberger meter, lighting arresters, and apparatus showing some novel effects of the two-phase alternating currents are also displayed in this section. In the corner of the space, a room has been built in which are shown a number of startling experiments in high-tension currents. Mr. Tesla expects to be present to utilize this room for exhibitions for invited guests during Congress week. The exhibit of long distance power transmission system consists of a complete plant with all the machines and apparatus necessary for the transmission and the reception of the electric current. The plant consists of a 500 horsepower two phase alternating current generator directly connected to a Pelton wheel. The plant consists of a 500 horsepower two-phase alternating current generator directly connected to a Pelton water wheel as illustrating the source of power, while the real power is furnished by a 500 horsepower two-phase Tesla motor, which is belted to the generator by a 24-inch belt. The prime generator is of new type, now known as the rotary transformer, although why it is so named is hard to say as it is simply a commutating device for an alternating current and might be better called a commutating machine. As used in this case, the full horsepower output can be taken off either in alternating or direct current, or any proportion of both currents at the same time. 
the machine is separately excited by a 5 horsepower direct current dynamo directly coupled to a Tesla motor of the same capacity. The dynamo may be easily made self-exciting. The primary voltage is of course provided for according to distance and load. In this case the voltage is 380. From the generator the current is conveyed to the switchboard by the wires which are concealed beneath the floor. From the switchboard the current is conveyed to the step up transformers for long distance transmission. This switchboard is of white marble mounted on an iron framework and is arranged after a design specially made for this work. It is provided with the necessary switches for controlling the 500 horsepower motor and the current from the generator so arranged that the current may be thrown from the step up transformers to any part of the exhibit. That last article was from August 10th, 1893 and we're going to step back a few months to March of 1893. Reading through a publication called The Electrical Worker in which we have a description of Nikola Tesla's lecture given in St. Louis. The Tesla lecture was a notable feature of the convention. At first it had been proposed to deliver the lecture in a small hall, but the demand for tickets was so enormous that it was decided as a matter of sheer necessity to secure a larger auditorium, and this was found in the exhibition theater, which seats about 4,000 people. It was, of course, practically impossible that all could hear and see but those who were there could at least say they had seen Mr. Tesla afar off and witnessed some of his most striking experiments. The hall was crowded to suffocation, and the demand for tickets was so great that they were selling briskly for three and five dollars on the steps of the hall. Under such circumstances, Mr. Tesla contended himself wisely with showing some of the more spectacular of his experiments and even these were followed at a disadvantage in view of the immense distance from which most of the spectators studied them. After his introduction by Mr. Ayer, the lecturer gave a few minutes to a statement of the conditions involved in his work, and then by means of his high frequency and high voltage currents, aided by disruptive discharge from a condenser through an induction coil, as well as by direct dynamic phenomenon, he produced a number of the interesting results that have already made his name famous and have charmed two worlds. He received unhurt currents of hundreds of thousands of volts, lit up tubes and lamps through his body, rendered insulated wires several feet long entirely luminous, showed a motor running under the influence of these million frequency currents, obtained a number of effects with phosphorescent lamps, and also showed how little in such work the high resistance of the filament had to do with the lighting up of ordinary 50 or 110 volt lamps. His ability to produce such effects, whether with a single wire and no return or without any wires at all, aroused the utmost interest and enthusiasm and the concluding demonstration literally brought down the house when he showed how by simply carrying lamps or tubes into a room or hall where those currents were being developed, illumination was the immediate result. In his opening remarks, Mr. Tesla enlarged upon the grandeur of nature and expressed his opinion that the most wonderful of the external influences that affect us is light. Hence it followed that the most wonderful and important of the organs by which these external influences beat in upon us is the eye. Two facts were especially referred to, one of them being that the eye is the only organ capable of being affected directly by the vibrations of the ether. Another fact was that the eye would be able to distinguish objects at almost any distance were it not for the minute particles and stray gases filling the intervening space. These absorb the energies of the ether vibrations, but in a pure medium they would travel unchecked and the range of vision would be infinitely greater. Mr. Tesla then alluded to the importance of the part played by the eye in furnishing the race with its ideas and knowledge and to its vital function in controlling all our motions and actions. From its teaching were derived consciousness, ideas, conceptions that were impossible without images, and images involved sight. By these interesting stages, Mr. Tesla led up to the subject of light 
and thence to the part of electricity in giving us light. The general aim of the discourse was to show and explain the phenomenon due to electrostatic forces, followed by phenomenon produced by electrodynamic agencies, and then, as a third class, the light effects. Mr. Tesla's idea evidently being to give a generalization of these phenomena and their relations. It was stated parenthetically with regard to the physiological effects produced with the high tension, high frequency currents employed, that a great amount of energy may be set into the body of a person by their means merely because the energy was dissipated literally from the body and was not passed through the body in the direct manner involved in the use of a low frequency current. It was due to this intense rapidity of vibration that the lecturer was able to receive with impunity currents of as high as 250 and 300,000 volts, and of an amount which otherwise administered would kill. The lecturer explained that he had so arranged his apparatus that in case of any failure of any part of it, the current would kindly abstain from killing him, and would only knock him down. Many of the experiments shown have already been seen either in this country or in Europe, yet there were several novel effects introduced, and even the familiar experiments were performed with apparatus different from that used before. In most of the experiments the ordinary alternating and continuous currents from the central station were used, although Mr. Tesla also had his own special generator running in the basement. A striking new experiment was to show at the beginning of the lecture the effect of a varying electrostatic stress through the dielectric. The experiment was performed by grasping one terminal of the high tension transformer, giving about 200,000 volts pressure, and approaching the other hand to the opposite terminal. Streams of violet light then issued from the fingers and the whole hand. At the lecture on the preceding Friday at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Professor Houston noticed that streams of light coming also from the lecturer's back, following roughly the line of the vertebral column. Another experiment was performed showing the action of the air between two condenser plates. By attaching these plates to the high tension transformer, the whole space between these plates was filled with light the distance apart being about 10 inches. It was pointed out that these streamers consumed considerable energy and developed abundantly ozone and nitrous acid, and it followed that it was necessary to exclude air from high tension apparatus. The action of the air was shown in another very striking experiment. Two incandescent lamps exactly alike, one exhausted, the other not. Both of the ordinary 50 volt type were attached in multiple arc and a current vibrating about 1 million times a second or thereabouts was passed through the filament. It was demonstrated that the lamp which was exhausted glowed brilliantly, whereas the other one in which the filament was surrounded by air at ordinary pressure did not glow. Yet the latter lamp got hotter than the other. This showed the great importance of the rarefied gas in the heating of a conductor and it was pointed out that the incandescent lighting, a high resistance filament does not at all constitute the really essential element of illumination along these lines. Also that heavy blocks of metal may be brought to incandescence by minute currents provided they are surrounded by rarefied gas and provided the potential and frequency of the currents is sufficiently high. One of the most interesting experiments was the conversation on open circuit. A transformer was taken and the current passed through the high tension winding in such a way that only one terminal was attached to the source of the rapidly alternating current. In spite of this, there was a current passing through the primary as though the other terminal was actually attached to the source like an ordinary return circuit. This open circuit transformer contained a secondary low tension winding and the minute currents passing through the primary were transformed into currents capable of following the ordinary electric wire and lighting up brilliantly an ordinary lamp. It was pointed out that under certain conditions, indeed such a conversion was quite practicable and that it could be practiced with high economy. 
It was further pointed out that any kind of device such as motors, etc. may be operated in this manner, with one wire or circuit only. Mr. Tesla in the course of his lecture dwelt upon his method of conversion by means of disruptive discharges from continuous or alternating station supply. There were two kinds of apparatus on the stage. One operated from the alternating circuit and the other from the regular direct current system. A peculiar form of discharger was contained in a mica-lined wooden box. The spark gap was warmed by a small lamp underneath for the purpose of making the air dielectrically weak. This enabled Mr. Tesla to work with a very long gap, a very sensitive arc, and a comparatively small electromotive force in the gap. The effects obtained were thus augmented very materially. It was pointed out that with this method of conversion, there is no difficulty whatever in obtaining sparks of any length. It becomes simply a question of the energy supplied, through what distance the spark will be visible. During the lecture, lamps were operated by this method of conversion. An ordinary 100 volt, a 50 volt, and a 2 volt lamp were brought up to full candle power with equal facility. Then a little motor was run by means of these disruptive discharges, it being a phase motor comprising simply an iron core with a closed secondary coil in it, and a disc armature arranged to rotate above the core. Mr. Tesla remarked rather naively that if the demonstration were not quite equal to the expectation, the long continued and weary work on the development of the invention, besides the inability of the experimenter, might be the cause. He went on, in connection with this, to refer to the transmission of power from Niagara and gracefully recognize the presence on the platform of Professor George Forbes, who was so prominently identified with this great work. Mr. Tesla believed that we were about to see such great powers transmitted long distances and over one wire. Continuing, Mr. Tesla remarked that he had shown things of a more spectacular nature with reluctance, yet forced thereto by the desire to gratify those who had shown their interest and formed so large an audience. A number of experiments were performed not seen in this country before, though some had been shown in England. For instance, a phosphorescent bulb was lighted up by being merely held in the hand and this was a most successful experiment. Mr. Tesla prefaced it by relating a little anecdote of Lord Rayleigh. When he was in London, remarked Mr. Tesla, with much feeling, he had the pleasure of performing this experiment privately before Lord Rayleigh, and he would always remember the trembling eagerness and excitement with which that distinguished scientist witnessed the lamp light up. The appreciation of such men, said Mr. Tesla, repaid him fully for the pains he had been at in working out these phenomena. In this experiment, a number of tubes were taken and flourished or flashed in various ways, and with the current made an intermittent at long intervals by adjusting the spark gap. Wonderfully beautiful effects were thus produced, the light of the world too being made to look like the white spokes of a wheel of glowing moonbeams. Then some rectangular tubes were taken and flashed or whirled so as to produce curious designs of luminous lines. A bulb was shown by Mr. Tesla said to him to be so highly exhausted that when the bulb was merely attached to one terminal of the disruptive discharge coil, it would send the sparks across the outside of the globe to the other terminal, which was on the opposite end, rather than pass through the bulb. The bulb in question was painted on one side with a phosphorescent powder, or mixture, and through a most dazzling light, far beyond that yielded by any ordinary phosphorescence. It was pointed out that there was no difficulty whatever in obtaining powerful phosphorescent effect in this way, and that a practical illuminant on these lines needed merely the perfection of the method of conversation above alluded to. In conclusion, the lecturer made fine cotton-covered wires stretched on a frame over the table luminous, so that in the dark they looked like attenuated violet caterpillars yards long, and then within a large rectangle formed by such wires, he flourished tubes in the interspace. 
these tubes flashing with light wherever waved. After the lecture, so great was the desire of the public to see Mr. Tesla closer, an informal reception was held in the lobby when several hundreds of the leading citizens seized the opportunity in Mr. Tesla's hand in a very vigorous manner. It should be added that the Electric Exchange of St. Louis presented Mr. Tesla at the beginning of the lecture with a magnificent floral shield, wrought in white carnations with a border of palms and the American Beauty roses. It was about four feet in diameter. In the center was a circle of red carnations bordering a tablet of white ones, bearing the letters in red, C equals E over R. Around the circumference were the floral letters St. Louis Electrical Exchange, 1893. Now, we are going to read one last section here from the Book of the Fair discussing the electrical showcase at the Columbian Exposition. While electric light and power have been prominent factors at former expositions, they have never been so largely used and applied to so many purposes as at the Chicago Fair. At the Paris Exposition of 1879, there were some 1,500 incandescent lamps, and at the New Orleans Cotton Centennial in 1881, both arc and incandescent lamps were utilized to good effect. At the latter, it was for the first time demonstrated that under this clear, white light, the delicate tints of flowers are almost as plainly visible as beneath the noonday sun. At the Louisville Exposition of 1883, there were 6,000 Edison lights, and at the one held in Paris in 1889, there were 1,000 arc and 9,000 incandescent lamps, both considered at the time a wonderful display of electric lighting. But in the buildings and the grounds at Jackson Park, there were 6,000 arc and 120,000 incandescent lamps, the former each of 2,000 candle power while moving force of from 4,000 to 5,000 horsepower was generated for purposes mentioned in the text. In the electrical building was installed apparatus of all descriptions, excepting generators, which were located elsewhere. Power for whatever purpose used was furnished and transmitted, as I have said, from the station at Machinery Hall, the plant being so constructed as to be complete in itself and yet composed of numerous smaller plants. The floor of the building was intended to sustain a minimum weight of 150 pounds to the square foot. By railroad derricks, machinery of a weight not exceeding 15 tons could be moved into position, and generating machinery up to a weight of 22 and a half tons could be handled by traveling cranes. Neither for illumination nor other purposes were any of the wires placed above ground, all being fastened on insulators enclosed by subterraneous conduits. The arc lights scattered throughout the park were supported by pillars, or masts 12 feet high, most of them 50 to 75 feet apart, and all arranged with a view to landscape effect. Side by side with the Edison exhibit of incandescent lamps, was a case containing many sections of fibrous vegetable growths, used by the inventor in his search for the substance best fitted for a lamp filament. The selection finally made was that of a Japanese bamboo, which is now extensively cultivated on special plantations. It is said that in arriving at this result, Edison traveled many thousands of miles and expended at least $200,000. Near the pavilion of the commercial cable company, a Fort Wayne establishment had an exhibit which overtopped all others in the galleries. It consisted of iron towers and poles such as are used in railroad construction and for street lighting. Nikola Tesla, the so-called wizard of physics, whose current motors are mentioned in connection with the Westinghouse Company's exhibit, is one of the youngest of our great electrical scientists and yet a man of worldwide repute. His fame rests mainly on his multi-phase alternating motors, whereby are produced high potential currents of remarkable frequency. On the 25th of August, he lectured in the assembly room of Agricultural Hall, before an audience consisting largely of electrical engineers and scientists. During his discourse, he exhibited a motor or oscillator driven by compressed air, 
which made 80 vibrations to the second, stating that he had made others capable of several thousand vibrations to the second. To this, he attached a dynamo small enough to be slipped into the pocket, and yet of considerable power. Considering that Nikola Tesla's greatest ambition was to rid the electrical infrastructure of its wires, projecting the power potential of a nation, or even civilization, into abundance, whatever happened to this idea? It does seem through various experiments that wireless electricity was indeed possible, only being presented on a scale for a particular audience in a lecture hall or auditorium. Was this technology not scalable to accommodate towns, cities, states, or nations? If anyone could accomplish the task of creating a wider wireless infrastructure, it would have indeed been Tesla's doing. Or was there simply no value in allowing the populace to access a potentially infinite power source from anywhere, from the environs in which we inhabit, the ether? How could this technology be monetized if it was not being directed through a channel or a line? If water was coming through a hose and you had a bucket, capturing that water would be quite simple and quantifiable. Trying to fill that same bucket during a rainstorm and capturing all the available water would seemingly be impossible. There is simply too much availability, an abundance. There is no limited supply, no scarcity. However, that channel or line does still exist to this day, and this is a curious aspect of our infrastructure. We have the ability now to peer back into the past with ease and view pictures depicting various aspects of our existence. There is a strange disconnect, at least in my opinion, with seeing the electrical infrastructure of over a century ago compared to now. Scenes from the late 19th century have an eerily similar power transportation system that we still see today. Looking at older images, we see wooden poles with connecting lines running electrical power to all areas that require it. Yet today, we see that same technology, that same delivery method of electricity. Why has this remained the same or even stagnant for so long? This isn't to say that other aspects have not progressed substantially since this time, even in the electrical field itself, but there are so many aspects of our society that have advanced forward in many respects, and why isn't the delivery of power one of them? Even thinking of the Kardashev scale, which is a proposed scale of civilization that centers around the harnessing of power. As a civilization increases its ability to harness greater and greater power, the more advanced and capable it becomes, allowing for incredible accomplishments in fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In tandem would no doubt have drastic impact on the quality of life of every citizen. It does seem unfortunate or even frustrating to see such a great potential during this time by a single individual to alter the trajectory of a nation fade into obscurity. With every article or written word of Tesla during this time period adds great insight to such an incredible thinker, inventor, and individual. It is equally met with melancholy as the ambitious possibilities that he sought have largely become myth or even conspiratorial. That isn't to say that his contributions did not revolutionize the electrical field, as alternating current was far superior to direct current, and reigns supreme still to this day for the majority of our electrical infrastructure. This presentation was only a small piece of the Nikola Tesla story, and hope it honors him in some meaningful way. I'll leave it to Tesla to explain this bittersweet fruit of invention written in 1913 to financier J.P. Morgan. Perhaps it is better in this present world of ours that a revolutionary idea or invention, instead of being helped and padded 
be hampered and ill-treated in its adolescence. By want of means, by selfish interest, pedantry, stupidity, and ignorance, that it be attacked and stifled, that it pass through bitter trials and tribulations, through the heartless strife of commercial existence. So do we get our light. So all that was great in the past was ridiculed, condemned, combated, suppressed, only to emerge all the more powerfully, all the more triumphantly from the struggle.